Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to learn more about the COVID-19 virus and the role of the Wexner Medical Center during the pandemic. I'm Gail Hogan. I will be your host for this evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees, with the exception of the panelists, are muted. This session is being recorded and will be available within the next few days. And throughout the webinar, please submit questions for the panelists and we will try to answer them as many as we can at the end of our discussion. So let's get started. This is the second webinar in our weekly series. Last week, we heard from three medical center leaders and this week, I am privileged to have with us three more experts to update us on the spread of the virus in Ohio and how it affects every one of us. Tonight, specifically, we will be addressing the topic of mental health and Good, we all have each other again, good. Okay. Uh, meet Dr. Ian Gontenhauser. <laughs> He's the Chief Quality and Safety Officer of the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Throughout the COVID-19 crisis, he has been the operational leader for the creation of the OSU COVID-19 call center, a rapid response hotline that is remotely staffed and has taken 1,500 calls a day from clinicians and patients. He's also co-lead the Convention Center Emergency Field Hospital Planning, and that's intended to provide up to 1,500 additional patient care spaces for Central Ohio. Welcome, Dr. Gonzenhauser. Thank you, Gail. Thanks for having me. Next, meet Dean Bernadette Melnick. Hello, Dean. Dean Melnick is the Vice President for Health Promotion, University Chief Wellness Officer, and Professor and Dean of the College of Nursing at The Ohio State University. She is an internationally recognized expert in evidence-based practice, intervention research, child and adolescent mental health, and health and wellness. At the start of the pandemic, Dean Melnick authored a scientific and extremely well-read article entitled, How to Talk to Your Children About the Coronavirus and Ease Their Anxiety. And she's serving as a critical advisor in particular in her role as Chief Wellness Officer. Thank you for being with us, Dean Melnick. Thank you, good to be here. And finally, meet uh, Dr. Lon Fawn. Dr. Fawn is Chair of the Department of Psychology and Behavioral Health and an international leader in the neuroscience of emotion, anxiety, and traumatic stress. He and his team are responsible for sustaining comprehensive care to patients with mental illness at all clinical settings at the Wexner Medical Center. Dr. Fawn is utilizing strategies to keep patients, families, and clinicians safe and healthy and guiding them on how to best cope with the stress of COVID-19 and physical separation in our communities and at our hospital. Welcome to you all. Thanks, Gail. Good to be with you. We have a series of questions for our panelists, and when our discussion is complete, we will open the dialogue from all of you with a chat feature, and we will limit the Q&A to about 15 minutes. So let's get started. And Dr. Gassenhauer, I'm going to begin with you. As an expert, what can we expect as the country and the state begin to re reopen? That's where we are today. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think this is the, the question on, on everybody's minds, right? What, what are things gonna look like a few weeks from now, a few months from now after we've reopened? Um, I, I think what we can expect is things are gonna look a little bit different than they did before this. And they're certainly gonna look differently uh, than they did as we've gone through this as well. Um, we can't social distance and isolate completely forever. We have to start reopening our economy, uh, getting people back to work, um, getting people back to their social interactions and the type of support uh, that we're gonna hear more about from uh, both Drs. Melnick and, and Juan um, Fon. The, the, the picture as we move forward is going to be one where we slowly and in a stepwise fashion start to dismantle some of the protections we've put in place while keeping others. Um, so we can expect that uh, there are going to be continued calls for sort of social distancing to continue with essential interactions uh, as the things that we, we, uh, that we pursue. Um, we can expect to see that businesses will remain limited in numbers of people that they'll allow in. Um, there will be expectations for masking, I think, in public spaces and uh, temperature checks for employees. I think all of those things are going to continue. The other thing that people have to be ready for is for the numbers to potentially continue to linger as they are right now and maybe even peak to some extent uh, in months to come. We really don't know exactly what this is going to look like until we've uh, got a few weeks under our belt, uh, but we're really looking to maximize the risk mitigation and make positive and, and, and uh, appropriate choices wherever possible uh, to try and protect ourselves and others. So I think we're going to see that while restrictions relax, people's personal 
choices, people's personal restrictions continue. Uh, and then lastly, we're gonna see a big increase in testing, uh, both uh, testing for coronavirus that's active, as well as testing for antibodies once we know how to use them. Uh, and we're starting to explore that now uh, within our institution. Thank you for that update. Uh, Dr. Fon, I'm gonna to turn to you. We've heard a lot about the toll that this pandemic is taking on frontline healthcare professionals. How has your team of mental health professionals been supporting the medical providers caring for the COVID-19 patients at OSU? Well, we've done that in a number of ways, Gail. Um, let me start by saying that through the news media and social media, our country and around the world, we've started to shine a, a spotlight on our healthcare professionals um, about the heroic acts that they're um, um, engaging in in our hospitals uh, and throughout our clinics. I think that in the past, people have often thought of the front line as soldiers or as first responders uh, in terms of our firefighters or police officers or our EMS uh, workers. However, now our healthcare professionals are really at the front line. And the spotlight, I think, should be sh shined upon the, the potentially emotional toll, toll that, that goes uh, into the minds and bodies of these healthcare workers in the hospitals because they carry on, they've always carried stressors. There's always been a risk and a crisis of burnout in our healthcare professionals, but now that's been amplified. I think it's amplified in a bunch of different ways. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty and anxiety and stress about being at the hospital, caring for sick patients, who get sicker and sicker and potentially uh, sadly die. Uh, there's also a lot of uncertainty and stress looking at your fellow healthcare providers um, and, and trying to support them as much as possible. And then there's the ongoing stress of, of worrying about whether you've got enough protective uh, equipment so, so you can protect yourself. And then lastly, um, that you're carrying this risk home as well to your families. And so the turmoil is pretty multifactorial and pretty expansive and pervasive. For us, uh, we're really lucky uh, on campus and at the medical center to have a lot of great uh, wellness programs that have existed over the years that has also been stood up and, and, and expanded uh, in the recent weeks. Here in the department, we're really lucky to have a program called STAR. That's the Stress, Trauma, uh, and, it, um, and resilience program. STAR was built actually 10 years ago for exactly this purpose, to support healthcare professionals as they endure stress during their work. Um, and what STAR has done is sort of gone on steroids these last few weeks. Um, it began by writing daily coping tips that are shared with all of our medical staff on a daily basis. It then stood up a um, daily boost support sessions that happen multiple times during the day that healthcare professionals can, can tune in and join a, a group support format uh, every day of the week, several times a day. Then um, STAR uh, erected a 24 hour, seven days a week support line that anyone can call in and talk to a clinician in a confidential private way to get support. STAR then also partners, uh, partnered with other uh, colleagues in the medical center to build out what it's developed, which is called BEST, Brief Emotional Support Teams, which is really a support team structure, um, peer to peer, essentially nurse to nurse, doctor to doctor, therapist to therapist, um, to, to sort of provide peer support in the health system. Also, our own psychiatry residents have chipped in and also volunteered their time to help out other residents and trainees in the medical center. And, um, and lastly, um, our own psychologists, psychiatrists have now stood up a specialized rapid access care track for all healthcare professionals to get immediate access uh, in, in the case that might, they might need something more than support um, uh, in terms of needing treatment, in terms of talk therapy or medication management. So those are the, the, the things that STAR has really done to partner with uh, many other uh, initiatives in the medical center to support our medical staff. Thank you, Dr. Fun. Dean Melnick, do you agree with what Dr. Fon has said about expecting burnout and depression and suicide in nurses and physicians? And, and if that's the case and it will worsen after the pandemic, what can be done to prevent the tsunami of mental health issues that, are, that might erupt within the medical system? I absolutely agree with Dr. Fon. Most people don't realize that burnout 
was affecting about 50% of mm. nurses, physicians, and other healthcare providers before the pandemic hit, which is why in 2017, the National Academy of Medicine launched an action collaborative on clinician well-being and resilience to come up with evidence-based solutions. I have had the privilege of being one of about 62 leaders throughout the country that serve on that National Academy of Medicine initiative. I'm happy to share with folks that because of what we have done at Ohio State to build such a terrific wellness culture, the National Academy of Medicine highlighted us as an exemplar institution for wellness. What I want people to understand is burnout, depression, suicide, not only affects healthcare providers and their families, but it is linked to quality and safety of healthcare. We know when clinicians are burnt out, they make more medical errors. These are well-meaning clinicians who are so dedicated to their work. And most people don't realize medical errors that are preventable are the third leading cause of death in America. The institutions that are gonna fare the best in this pandemic are the ones that have built such solid wellness cultures, have a lot of programming like we just described for our clinicians. We've got to shift our mentality from crisis intervention, and I'm not talking about us at Ohio State, to prevention. Most people don't think about these issues until these pandemics or other crises happen. We long have thought about these issues, put a great wellness culture in place. And I think our clinicians are gonna fare better than most because of the investments that we've made. Thank you, Dean Melnick and uh, Dr. Gossenhauer to continue that part of the conversation. As Dean Melnick pointed out, it is the um, environment, the safety, that is uh, a, a good portion of you know, preventing burnout if they feel safe in their environment. So as the Chief Wellness Officer, what are you doing to ensure that safety and secure environment for those frontline workers at Ohio State? So they, uh, for, yeah, Dr. Malnick, yeah. Bird, do you, do you want to take that for the chief wellness officer position? Yeah. Sure, I'll be happy to take that. So, Gail, as soon as the pandemic hit, we went into rapid action. We produced all of these fabulous programs, which, which actually are open to the people on this webinar tonight. We're running an eight week weekly series called Stay Calm and Well in the midst of the COVID storm. We are doing online programming that we used to do on site because so many people, again, are under such stress during this time. So, We've kicked in in a big way, but the reason we could do that 
is because of the fabulous wellness team that's already in place at Ohio State. Ian, do you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think that this, uh, the, the safety and security of our staff, of our employees, of our clinicians is, is, is paramount to our mission. Um, if we don't protect that workforce and that group of people who are giving everything every single day, um, there's no way that we can stand up and take care of the needs of Central Ohio's patients that we're so committed to. Um, so I think all of the programs that have been described are, are these critical, fundamental programs to help people in their times of need as providers who are facing really un, unimaginable uh, circumstances, things that, that nobody really thought that they were going to be seeing necessarily in their lifetime. On the other side of that are all the things that we're doing as a health system uh, to try and address the safety issues in the environment itself. So what are the things that we can be doing uh, to try and really fundamentally change the nature of feeling safe and secure as you go about that daily work that's grueling in and of itself without feeling that you're at risk as a provider as well. So I think what comes into play there are all the things that we're doing around staff and patient screening, um, all the ways that we're trying to ensure that our supply chains are robust and we can give everybody the right equipment uh, for the right interactions at the right time that we can really say to our staff and our employees, you know, we have your back in this and we're not gonna put you in a situation uh, where we're not gonna be mitigating the risk that you're, that you're uh, exposed to as a frontline provider. We wanna make sure at every step of the way that we have lines of communication open, that we have protocols and policies in place and that we have the robust supply chain to again, ensure that our staff are as protected as they can possibly be so that that's not an additional component of their burnout or undercutting their resiliency. Because you can imagine if you're walking into a grueling workday uh, and on your mind is, am I safe? Is my institution doing everything that they can mm -hmm. do to protect me? Um, that, that's a, a really challenging place to start. And that would lead us to far more uh, providers who are, who are feeling these emotions uh, and these really, really, um, really challenging circumstances. So, um, so much being done with our clinical epidemiologists, with our supply chain folks, um, with our lab, with our patient screening and our patient advocates uh, to try and bolster the front side of this and put programs and support in place uh, so that we can limit the number of folks who are then progressing to burnout and have to access these other really incredible systems and programs that we put in place. So it really is a full spectrum approach and a full court press amongst all of these various programs uh, to ensure that we're doing everything possible for, for our staff. And I think we've done a great job with that. Um, and, and I think having programs like uh, what Dr. Melnick um, and Dr. Fon have de described in place, that is just absolutely critical. And we are lucky. And we are lucky that we're Buckeyes because it's not every organization that has programs like that in place. Um, so, so continuing to support them, continuing to see them grow, um, that is you know, one of the top priorities at this time. Thank you, Dr. Gonsenhauser. And Dr. Fon, let's skip now from the medical center to the community. What kind of psychological effect is COVID-19 having now on the community and going to have on the weeks and apparently months to come? You know, I think as, as we think about our community, um, I sort of be, uh, think about the myriad of emotions that have uh, come to bear uh, in, in, in us and in, in each other. I think when the infection began to be noticed and there was more of a fear of infection, what we had was a lot of anxiety, panic, worry, and apprehension. That I think evolved and there's a new set of emotions now that are um, uh, at play. And, and those set of emotions revolve around grief, which is really a deep sorrow and despair around things that we've lost. I mean, obviously the largest loss is in, in loss of health or loss of life in, in, in a patient or um, in a loved one. But I think as a broad community, we've lost so many, many other things, um, financial losses, work losses, uh, students have been away from school, so they've lost their, their identity as students. Uh, we can't go to churches. We don't have the extracurricular activities that we normally participate in. We're losing weddings um, and other things uh, like social gatherings, summer and spring vacations, family reunions. 
And ultimately, the, the, the biggest overall loss, the pervasive loss, is the loss of normalcy, the, the loss of our usual routine, the, the, the loss, loss of what was previously normal. And that sense of loss leads to a lot of deep sorrow and despair. And, and even though we have um, been asked to physically dist distance from one another, what's that, what's that led to is a sense of social isolation and disconnectedness amongst each other. And, and because of that, that sort of led to a double whammy of sorts uh, in our communities. Um, all those things that I mentioned, Gail, are things that we typically rely on as buffers against stress. Um, and so not only um, do we fear about the illness and all these losses, we can't rely on the things that have helped us in the past. Mm -hmm. And so those are the emotions that, that, that I think have, have really impacted our communities. Moving forward, those things don't go away, sadly. Uh, if anything, they're going to intensify over time as we return to what, what, what we call a new normal, as we return to work or as we ret return to social gatherings or to, to churches uh, and reconvene, there will still be a lot of um, uh, check uh, points in, in place and a lot of recommendations still to stay away from one another. As Ian had said, it's going to be a very slow phased in process. And there's going to be a lot of anxiety around that. Uh, we as humans hate anxiety. Anxiety breeds distress and fear, you know, and, and because of that, we can't predict at all uh, what things will look like uh, for, for, for many of us who have family and friends and children. And they ask us literally uh, as physicians, what's going to happen next? We don't have the answers, um, f the full answers that, that, that um, is comforting enough, right? And so this uncertainty of how we return, uh, whether there'll be a research or relapse of infection, how do we keep each other uh, as safe as we've been? Um, how do we sort of maintain this, this culture of safety and care with each other? There's still a lot of uncertainty and that's gonna continue to mount over time. We just hope that um, as a community, because we've come together as, as, we, as we've been over these last few weeks, we will have had a, a different sense of community uh, that will protect us as we move forward uh, with these ongoing times of uncertainty. It would be nice if there was a silver lining in that what you just said that we come together more as a, as a community and the people. Actually, there is there is a su uh, silver lining. I've been very much uh, worried about uh, the epidemic that has uh, been the undercurrent across America, which is the epidemic of suicide. You know, obviously, um, from when we look back at the healthcare professional perspective, we learned about a very sad story earlier this week when a head of the emergency department in New York City took her own life because she was caring for patients with COVID-19 and came down with the infection herself and tried to get back to work. Um, and suicide has been a major epidemic in our country. 130 people die by suicide every day uh, of every year, and that rate has been going up and up, and it's, it's no different here in Ohio and certainly in central Ohio. So that's, that's been one of my major concerns. What are, what are the unintended consequences of social distancing as it relates to our emotional health? There is a silver lining, and, and I'll sort of uh, continue with that, mainly because I do think there's optimism out there. When we think about the suicide rate, it actually went down with the last major disaster that our country had, which is in 9-11. Suicide rates actually went down after 9-11, when one would think that with all the fears and on the, all the uncertainty about potential terrorist attack, the, our communities actually banded together. And that sense of connectedness, that, that sense that we're all in it together, really made a fundamental difference in the suicide rate um, after that major national event. So I'm hoping the same will be uh, the case here. Thank you, Dr. Fon. Dean Melnick, you wrote an article about how children are affected and they, they absorb more than we know sometimes. Um, can you give some advice to parents? And also, I know there's anxiety of children of first responders. They know too that mom and, or dad or both are, are on front lines of this. Absolutely. One of the best pieces of advice that I can give parents is that the more anxious they are, it's going to be contagious onto their children. So we've got a role model, really good, strong coping behaviors to set that stage for our children. 
But the other things that are key, we've got to find out what is worrying our children. We need to ask them, what are you most worried about right now? Little children, less than five, they have a hard time putting into words their anxieties, their stressors. They often talk about how their stuffed animals or dolls are feeling. And as parents, we should ask, how's your puppy doing today? Because a lot of times, the kids will communicate better, those young kids, about what their dolls, their dogs, are experienced that they're projecting onto them. The last thing I want to say about children and even adults, we have so much negative media coming at us day in, day out, all the tragic stories. If you expose your children or yourself to too much of that, that's going to negatively affect us. So I tell everybody, go to reliable websites like our Ohio Department of Health, our Centers for Disease Control. Check up if you want to see the figures that way. But limit the amount of negative media exposure to yourself and to your children. Thank you, Dean Melnick. Good advice. Dr. Gonsenhauer, on that, giving advice, there are, are still people wondering as we go forward, do we still need to social distance? Did it really work? Should we continue? Thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we absolutely do. And um, I've, I've had many people come up to me and, and a, a little bit angrily even ask me, you know, why did we do all this? After all, this hasn't been a big deal for us here in Central Ohio. And my response to that is, you know, we've done this so that you could ask that question. We've done all this so that we're in a position that you can feel that way. Because that sense of, um, you know, futility, why did we do this in the first place? Um, we're only able to say that right now because of all of those things that we've done. Because we did, in fact, flatten the curve. Uh, we did avoid a surge like the surge they saw in New York City. Um, we didn't overwhelm our healthcare systems. Uh, and we kept a lot of people out of hospitals and we kept a lot of people alive. We have to continue doing the things that we're doing right now uh, to some extent for the foreseeable future. Um, if we don't do that, you know, we're well aware that this virus is alive and well in our communities, uh, likely at much greater numbers than we actually even even thought a few weeks ago. Um, as we start getting into antibody testing, we're going to be able to sort of illuminate that even more so. Uh, but if we drop everything and go back to the status quo at this point, um, we're going to be right back where we started and we're going to see the second wave that people are concerned about. So um, even as restrictions start to lift, even as we start to see business as usual start to, to come back, it's really on us to make the intelligent choices uh, the wise decisions and the risk mitigating choices that are going to keep people healthy and, and keep this from resurging. Uh, so, so absolutely, we have to continue to do a lot of the same things that we're doing right now. It's really hard. It's hard for everybody, uh, but it has paid huge dividends already. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. And, and really, every time we raise the question, what have we done this for? Should we be getting back to, to, to normalcy? Um, you have to stop and think about all of the folks that have lost a loved one, uh, all of the folks that have had a debilitating stay in an ICU that's going to affect them potentially for their lifetime. I mean, there are long-term uh, psychologic, psychological consequences to being in an ICU, potentially. Um, so we have to really consider them, consider the sacrifice uh, that, that they have made uh, and, and not make that all for nothing. So um, stick together, be strong, we're in it together. We can keep doing this, and we really owe it to each other to do exactly that. 
Great, Dr. Kotzenhauer, thank you. I would just like to remind those who are watching and listening, if you do have a question, please submit it. Uh, we will be getting to your questions shortly. Um, Dr. Fon, uh, to you, what research and clinical innovations are your department faculty working on to address the COVID-19 pandemic? I think you hinted at some of the internists or um, younger faculty making themselves available. Is there anything else that your department is doing? Yeah, we've, we've, we're doing a lot of things, Gail. Um, let, let me start on the research side. Um, we're lucky to have a lot of faculty in the department tracking the emotional and mental consequences of the pandemic in our, in our, um, in our communities uh, by, by seeing what are the emotional changes uh, in our citizens. Um, does it lead to uh, bad behaviors, things like self-medicating with increased alcohol use? So there are research studies going on like that. Uh, our department and many laboratories within the department has always believed in the uh, studying the brain. And all those emotions that I talked about uh, culminate in stress. And stress is rooted in the brain and it affects the brain. And then the brain has um, sends signals to the rest of their body uh, in terms of physiological changes that our body um, goes through from our heart to our lungs to our immune system. So we have experts within the department following up on those uh, on those research questions as well. I'll, I'll give you sort of a, a, a kind of a, a, a story or, or, a, uh, or a corollary to this. When people work at home, I think in, in the beginning when, when we sent people home, the initial thought was that it was gonna be kind of a, a staycation, that, that things would be relaxed. But the more I talk to people who are at home, they're actually more exhausted than they've ever been. You know, when noon hits, it, it's almost as if they've worked for 20 hours, even though it's only been a few hours. Um, and, and that's coupled with, you know, the, uh, the, the stress that, that, that we feel, right? Um, the, the, the stress that comes into our brain, all of our emotions that I talked about earlier, just translates into our, our bodies uh, because our bodies are, are working harder than it, it really uh, is intended to do. And so that's what manifests. On the clinical side, we've done a bunch of very um, impactful things. Um, Harding Hospital was probably one of the first units within the medical center to restrict patients uh, to come into our locked units to, to visit family uh, who were in the psychiatric hospitals. We knew that was going to lead to a, uh, an emotional ramification and a neg negative one at that for our patients, but also our families. Imagine not being able to have uh, visitors in, into the psychiatric hospital. So we had to innovate strategies, giving everyone an iPad so that they can face time and connect with family members during the course of the day so that they, uh, they don't feel alone in the hospital. So that was really key for us. The, the second uh, thing that, that we're doing, uh, which I thought was uh, quite impactful, was for the ambulatory and the outpatient visits. We had a very small footprint in telemedicine, telehealth prior to COVID-19. We essentially went from near zero to near 100%, converting all of our mental health visits in the ambulatory setting to telephone and, and more recently uh, to video. Um, and by that, we, we've actually not lost any of our uh, access to care. As a matter of fact, we remain quite available to all of our patients through whatever means necessary, which includes telemedicine. So I think that was a a big pivot for us, but a pivot that we, we did very, very expeditiously to care for our patients, to, to let them know that we're still here for them, uh, especially during times of vulnerability. The last is, is something that we're developing um, in, um, uh, in this, these last couple of weeks. Um, we're standing up a clinical program in which we intend to follow every single COVID-19 positive patient at the Wexner Medical Center. We will follow them to look at their mental health. We'll also look at their cognitive um, uh, deficits that may follow from the infection, particularly those who might have gone into the ICU and might have had to be intubated uh, or be on a ventilator. So there will be a, a dedicated team in our department to look at the emotional well being and, and, and the cognitive well being of all patients from the Wexner Medical Center who come down with COVID 19. So those, I think, are, are a series or, or a few things that I wanted to highlight going on in terms of research and clinical innovation in the department. Great. Thank you, Dr. Fon. I'm going to questions now. Dr. Gonsenhauer, I have a question here that um, someone has submitted saying, since Ohio will be rolling out ramped up testing next month, do we think testing will ever make it to those who are asymptomatic? 
Yeah, you know, I, I think it depends on the modality of the testing. Um, I, I do think that antibody testing is likely to be more widespread and deployed um, more likely towards asymptomatic patients than the current PCR testing that's being used. Um, we do see some asymptomatic testing or exposure testing already uh, for folks who are, are high risk or are in high risk occupations like healthcare workers or first responders. Um, and others. So um, we, we're still, it's a little too early to, to really be able to key into the strategy that's going to follow the antibody testing. But um, by all accounts right now, if it's effective and accurate and validated, um, even in the asymptomatic population, which it likely will be, um, I do think we'll start deploying that to understand where populations are at risk, if different communities are at risk, um, and where we can start focusing, uh, you know, more, more aggressive reopenings or not. You know, there's so much that's on hold right now, and there's so much that we can't imagine putting back to normal. Things like uh, football games and weddings and church services, these larger gatherings of people, uh, that we're really not going to know what risk they present to the public until we have a broader sense of how many exposures there have been. Um, so there's a lot to learn from antibody testing. I don't think we can learn it without doing asymptomatic testing. So I believe that we will see that. It's just a little too early to tell how it's going to work and when. Thanks, Dr. Gunsenhauer. And I'm going to ask you to um, begin this next question, but I would like all of you to answer, answer within, if possible. How does philanthropy move the needle in helping Ohio fight COVID-19? Yeah, so in, in, in so many ways. Um, so, so one thing that I would point to immediately is that all of the really tremendous programs that you've heard described tonight, uh, the, the wellness programs, particularly the staff support programs, these are not revenue generating programs, right? This is not a service line in our health system that's generating revenue. So finding support for them, we have to be a lot more creative in how we do that, right? This isn't like funding an extension of a neurosurgical service where we know um, each new provider is gonna bring in revenue that's going to support the service and support the investment. These are programs that we have to invest in through different means, either by borrowing from operational uh, revenue or through philanthropy. And philanthropy is by far the most compelling uh, and the strongest uh, advocate for putting programs like this in, in supportive positions and in positions of strength, uh, because you really are not only speaking uh, about the importance of, of the program, but you're, you're representing an interest from the community that says, this is something that we have deemed so important in supporting the organization that we're really willing to put uh, a gift behind it. That speaks volumes to the organization, and that's a way of really substantiating the necessity of a program to stay in place. So, um, you know, those are programs that would, would greatly, greatly benefit. Certainly um, allowing people to dedicate their time for research uh, that it may be too early in the, the whole scope of this uh, for there to be national funding or federal funding for that research. That's another great place that we can provide support. So I think for, for those programs, um, Philanthropy is just absolutely critical. We really can't do it without it. Thank you. Um, Dean Melnick. Yes, I have a great example of a grant that we just got from Trusted Health in California. The lead of innovation called me because of our national wellness reputation. And he said, we are sending our nurses into the hot spots now. New York City, Detroit, our nurses are distressed. What can you do to help us if we give you a grant? So what we did was establish this wonderful national wellness hub for nurses on the front lines. And we have an emotional support line. We're taking calls from distraught nurses. And in three weeks, our nurse practitioner students are gonna function as wellness support partners for these nurses for four to eight weeks helping them stay calm 
and well while they're providing care to COVID patients. So that's just an awesome example of how philanthropy can help us do so much more than we can. That's a great story. Thank you, Dean. And Dr. Fon, any thoughts? Yeah, I'll say uh, uh, three quick things. Uh, first, of, um, to, to say that all the great things that I talked to you about what STAR did for our department 10 years ago and over the last 10 years, it was philanthropy and donors within our communities that really stood up STAR, supported STAR for what it does. And, and so I, I want to acknowledge that the many donors over the years that really supported STAR and now they're finding uh, perhaps for the first time the impact that STAR can have right within our medical center. Uh, so it's really important to know. The, the second is to dovetail what Ian brought up, which is there are services in our, in our medical center that isn't well supported, isn't reimbursed by the typical insurance companies. And one of those key things is case management. Case management is really a navigator. And as patients come out of COVID-19 and need different kinds of care across our health system, they're gonna need a navigator to connect them to the primary care doc, the mental health provider, the uh, social services in the community, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and coordinating subspecialty services that they need. And really healthcare navigators are really an investment from the medical center to us to provide. And, and that's often not a reimbursable service. The last thing is, is also to, uh, to continue what Ian had brought up, which is we have an infrastructure to do really great research. Um, if we wait for the federal government, the National Institutes of Health to fund it, we're waiting for months, perhaps even to a year before sort of a call comes out for funding because that's how th things typically work. But if philanthropy could step in, we can actually start doing a lot of that innovative, high risk, high reward research today, right now, uh, rather than waiting for an external source to fund us. Great, thank you. Unfortunately, this is all the time that we have this evening. Dr. Gonsenhauer, Dean Melnick, Dr. Fon, thank you all for being here this evening and helping Ohio lead the way during this pandemic. And thank you all for joining us, all those who are listening and watching. I hope you join us next week for up to the minute information about COVID-19 from the front lines. And if you are interested in ways to help, please visit the website on the screen in the fight against coronavirus. And join Ohio State on May 5th for Giving Tuesday Now, a global day of giving and unity where all dollars raised will support the emergency response to COVID-19 support and research efforts. Thank you all again. Thank you, Gail. Go Bucks. Yeah. Go Bucks. Thank you all. Be safe. <laughs>